before we begin, some quick announcements. By now, most of, us, most of us have grown used to Zoom meetings, large and small. This one is a large one. So to avoid ambient noise and other interruptions, we have muted all participants. We will unmute when it's time to recite the Athenian Oath, which we hope to hear everyone participate in reading towards the end of the ceremony. In lieu of a reception, the reception that we normally hold following the convocation, many of the professors on the meeting today have set up a Zoom room so students can drop in and visit with them. We distributed instructions for accessing these meetings earlier in the week. Please take the opportunity to drop in and have some face time with your professors so they can wish you well. With those formalities aside, please relax and enjoy. Welcome to the 2020 Convocation of the Department of Public Administration and International Affairs in the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. I'm Associate Dean Bob Bifolco, Chair of the Department of Public Administration and International Affairs, and it is my honor to welcome you here today. I acknowledge with respect the Onondaga Nation, firekeepers of the Haudenosaunee, the indigenous people on whose ancestral lands Syracuse University now stands. Well, it's certainly been an extraordinary year. Midway through the spring semester, we were all called upon to adjust to an unprecedented pandemic and the attendant upheaval of longstanding routines. We have all learned the ins and outs of teleconferencing and have seen the words, you're still muted, become the most repeated phrase in the English language. Many of us have grown our hair out for the very first time in years, have enjoyed going days without wearing shoes, and have survived more time with our families and pets than we thought possible. We have all learned just how awkward online happy hours can be, and in general has spent far too much time in front of our computers. Kidding aside, the uncertainty and upheaval of the last few months has caused anxiety during programs, which under the best of times are challenging, and impacts on home lives, families, and health have caused serious problems for many of us. In the face of this, the accomplishments that we are celebrating with this ceremony are even more impressive than usual. Also, we have been living through a year of considerable civil unrest. The tragic killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery have exposed that issues of racism and racial justice remain this country's central challenge. The personal loss involved in these cases are reasons for great sadness, and I am reluctant to look for trite silver linings. However, I think recent events do highlight just how important public policy and public administration can be. The recent calls for change should inspire us all. For you, our graduates, they should spur you to take the knowledge and skills you have acquired with us and go out into the world to help make it a better place. To steal a phrase from Professor Nabachi, rarely has there been a more resounding call to use your powers for good. We hope that we have provided you with the knowledge and skills to make a meaningful contribution to solving whatever problems you choose to take on. By providing service to others, you will put into practice the words of the Athenian oath that we will all recite at the close of the ceremony. If we have done our job well, the perspectives that we have offered, the blending of quantitative reasoning economic analysis, management, budgeting, ethics, and the political context of public administration will help you navigate the challenges you will undoubtedly face with the force of reason as well as passion. It is our custom to have a graduating student offer a greeting to our guests on behalf of the class. Christopher Rondinelli is a Lieutenant in the United States Navy and is completing our Executive Masters in International Relations. He has served as a Nuclear Surface Warfare Officer on the USS Sentry and the USS George Washington. 
On the USS Sentry, he led the combat, system, combat systems team while forward deployed to Bahrain. And on the US George USS George Washington, he led a department in refueling two nuclear reactors. Currently is stationed at the Pentagon as a strategic plans officer. Chris? Thank you, Professor Balfuco. Uh, good morning, fellow graduates, esteemed faculty and staff, Maxwell trustees, families and friends. It is my honor to welcome you to the 2020 convocation. I think that it's safe to say that 2020 so far has not quite turned out to be what we expected. It's most definitely thrown some challenges our way and is the central reason why we are all attending our graduation online rather than in person today. But not to be deterred, we should apply and embrace the abiding and inspiring mantra that has helped us face 2020 so far. We stand together. To get to this point, each one of us has had help from so many people, our families, parents, siblings, spouses, children, and our friends, old and new, have supported us through our studies each and every step of the way so we could stand here today and celebrate our achievements. Our professors whose superior knowledge and excellent teaching has allowed us to learn, explore, and grow, developing our understanding and forging new ideas as we head forth into our futures. Our fellow classmates who have challenged our thinking, shared new perspectives, and informed our ideas. Together, we have stood by each other's sides and forged new relationships that send us forward confidently into these challenging times. We stand together as we have all done through our studies, and we stand together as we face the new future ahead of us. And stand together we will. As students of the Maxwell School, we have a common bond that unites us all. So with all that being said, know that as you take your next steps, you are not alone. We stand together. Congratulations. Thanks, Chris. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce to you Dean of the Maxwell School, David Van Slyke. Dean Van Slyke is the former Chair of Public Administration and International Affairs, and he's also a tenured full professor at the Maxwell School. He is a two-time recipient of the Burkhead Burkett Award for Teaching Excellence, and he is also the recipient of the Louis A. Bantle Chair in Business Government Policy. He has been on the Maxwell School faculty since 2004, and began serving as the Maxwell School's Dean in 2016. Dean Van Slyke is a leading international expert on public-private partnerships, public sector contracting, and policy implementation. He has provided expert guidance to the Office of Management and Budget, the Government Accountability Office, the Department of Defense, the U.S. Coast Guard, and the World Bank, and has worked extensively with senior leaders in government, nonprofit and business organizations in China, India, Peru, Singapore, and Thailand, among other countries. We are very fortunate to have him at the helm. David? Uh, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the event you thought might never come, the Maxwell School 2020 Graduate Convocation. And thank you to our friend Naomi Barry Perez for being a part of today's ceremony and your continued service to our nation and to all peoples in ensuring fair and equitable employment opportunities. I want to acknowledge and thank our faculty who display extraordinary dedication to your success and the success of the program and to Associate Dean and Chair Professor Bob Bifoco for whom my admiration for his leadership only continues to grow as he manages a very difficult situation in terms of how to make sure that all students have the rigorous academic experience that they came to the Maxwell School for. Thank you, Bob, and thanks to all our faculty. One of the things that makes the Maxwell School so different from any other school in respect to our role and mission is that we are a school committed to public administration, policy, and public service within a school of social sciences. We have a deep commitment to interdisciplinary scholarship and teaching coupled with engaged citizenship. Our history, success, and commitment to this approach 
is integral to attracting and educating outstanding students who go on to become leaders like Naomi that serve citizens and advance the public dimensions of each of our lives. The challenges ahead of you, our school, our university, and our countries is significant. We don't just encourage you to lead in making a difference in your organizations and your communities. We are counting on you to do so. Your Maxwell experience this year was unique. Unfortunately, your time on campus was cut short by the COVID-19 pandemic, and you completed your classes, research, and projects online. You, along with our faculty and staff, had to work hard to adapt and persevere to get here today. And you have succeeded, but the pandemic continues to expand and impact all people across the globe and disproportionately those that are already vulnerable and on the margins of society. There may be no greater example in our lifetime of the need for trusted and capable leadership on local, regional, national, and international levels to ensure the health, safety, and success of our citizens and our communities. You also experienced our continued struggle with and failure at creating a society that embodies the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all peoples. As we work to make progress on our campus and in all our communities here and around the world, we must do so in actionable and measurable ways, in the ways we treat one another, in those we hire and work with, and on those things we advocate for and protest against. And we must tirelessly be engaged with actions as well as ideas and words to work toward a society that disavows racist, anti-Semitic, and hateful acts. To do so, we need strong leaders and citizens to move us forward from this very painful and unacceptable position. And you are those people. While these historic challenges seem daunting, I remain optimistic for our collective future. I see in you a hunger and a passion to speak out, to act, and to take a stand respectfully and with a long view as to how serious our commitment must be to achieve the outcomes we desire. You are committed to action for the collective good. You know, perhaps better than previous generations, that the rights many of us have always expected and enjoyed are not shared equally. You acknowledge that none of us will succeed if all of us do not have an opportunity to succeed. It will not be easy, but I have a sense of what you have learned and experienced at Maxwell. And I am certain that you are committed to the ideals of the Athenian Oath. And you are committed to ensuring that they apply to all, regardless of race, ethnicity, sexuality, gender, disability, or religious beliefs. I'm confident that you will work to ensure that your cities are greater, better, and more beautiful for all peoples. And you will lead us in that, and you will lead us and others in this work. You are committed to deeds and outcomes and not only words. We share a great sense of pride in your achievements on this special and happy occasion. Your greatest supporters, your greatest fans are with us today. And I'd ask you to join me in a round of applause for your family members, and for the faculty and staff who have provided support and encouragement. I thank our graduates for making the decision to invest in strengthening our nation and many other nations around the world. We respect and value your work on behalf of public, nonprofit, and private organizations that are committed to making a positive difference in the lives of others. Your desire to give back in a variety of ways and the public responsibilities that you will take on professionally and philanthropically through your volunteerism and giving are important contributions to advance our societies. Maxwell has a broad reach 
and its 33,000 dedicated alumni in 147 countries welcome you to a powerful worldwide network. When you entered Maxwell, you became part of the ever-expanding family. And on Monday, another class will enter. And they, along with all of our undergraduate and graduate students and Maxwell, will need your support in the future. There are four things that I ask every Maxwell graduate to do, and they are things that you can do that we need you to do immediately, starting today, tomorrow, or next week. First, refer great prospective students to Maxwell, both for their graduate and undergraduate education. Help Maxwell students and alumni network for internships and job opportunities at the great organizations where you work and volunteer. Stay in touch with us and brag to us about yourself and your careers. Maxwell's reputation is elevated by the incredible work and success of our graduates. We will celebrate your news widely in our communications. And please make Maxwell a philanthropic priority in your life. Among the many organizations you may choose to support with your charitable giving, once you're done paying your college loans, Maxwell is worthy of your investment and generosity. As Dean, I can promise you that every gift is important to Maxwell's success, and we will use that support well. It is my privilege to congratulate you, your families and friends on your achievements here. We know it is just the start of your many contributions to society, to the Maxwell School, and to Syracuse University in the future. Congratulations to you. Thank you for being a part of Maxwell. Good luck and go orange. Thank you, Dean Van Slyke. It is now my privilege to introduce to you your convocation keynote speaker. Naomi Barry Perez holds a bachelor's degree from Mount Holyoke College and an MPA from the Maxwell School. In addition, she held a public interest law fellowship at Georgetown University where she received a law degree. Ms. Barry Perez has served as Director of Civil Rights for the U.S. Department of Labor since 2012. In this position, she directs the Department of Labor's Civil Rights Enforcement and Compliance Program. She also serves as, the, as a Principal Advisor to the Secretary of Labor on Civil Rights and Equal Employment Opportunity. Ms. Barry Perez is the recipient of numerous natural, national awards, including the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute Alumni Achievement Award, Secretary of Labor Exceptional Service Awards, and the inaugural Federal Employee Leadership Award given by Nash, the National Farm Worker Conference. Among her many accomplishments, Ms. Barry Perez has published implementing regulations for the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, regulations which significantly enhance enforcement of civil rights protections. She established a reasonable accommodation resource center to help research, test, implement, and monitor reasonable accommodations for employees with disabilities. She has actively steered efforts to advance an awareness of the rights of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender individuals, efforts which have resulted in the issuance of comprehensive policy statements and actions. Additionally, she was responsible for coordinating efforts pertaining to persons with limited English proficiency and migrant seasonal farm workers, resulting in the department's guidance regarding the prohibition against national origin discrimination. You will hear several calls today to use your newly acquired powers to make the world a better and more just place. There is no better example I can offer for how to do that the Naomi Barry Perez, who I'm honored to welcome to today's ceremony. Thank you and good morning. Thank you, Associate Dean Bifulco, Dean Van Slyke, faculty and staff, and my fellow alumni for the honor of addressing you today. I am also joined by some former classmates and other friends who support me and hold me accountable and will do the same for you. I am a career public servant, and the following remarks are my own and are not meant to reflect any position of my employer. 
I wish you sincere congratulations and I wish very much that you could enjoy this accomplishment in a more traditional way. I wish you could shake hands with your professors, laugh heartily with your classmates, and continue passionate conversations with the goal of solving the world's problems. I promise that you will benefit from the Maxwell Mafia for years to come, although your experience was profoundly different than former classes. I wish you strength and purpose to come out of this experience with values that shape your future even more than your proper education. When I was asked to address you at the beginning of the pandemic, I thought I would speak about interdependence, how a virus does not discriminate or segregate and should compel government and citizens alike to recognize the need for common humanity. Sadly, we've experienced a response that has reflected and perpetuated disproportionate care and outcomes. I thought I would speak about how government work to coordinate and collaborate, leverage resources, and promoted science to solve a public health crisis. Instead, we've experienced disjointed and inconsistent leadership and a public response that reflects confusion, fear, and eroded trust. As the capstone to my Maxwell experience, we studied the Challenger tragedy and a public administration fraught with politics and bureaucracy, as it is, and I reference neither as bad words, just as reality. The Challenger was a visible and uncontestable failing of government. The public saw it happen before their eyes. We identified with the men and women of the flight, not hyperbole or symbol. We watched the shuttle explode and bring down with it real lives and real futures. Your capstone has been a worldwide pandemic highlighting the failures of government to prepare and respond effectively and widespread civil unrest in response to systemic racism. The murder of black men and women is not new. Indeed, while I was a student at Maxwell, James Byrd was tied to a truck and dragged to his death by white supremacists in Texas. Congress responded by enacting hate crimes legislation in his name. You also encountered racism, xenophobia, and anti-Semitism at Syracuse University in your fall semester. One of the benefits of the Maxwell program is its length, not just that its rigor is rewarded with shorter tenure, but that your goal and the realization of that goal is tangible. Some of you will remember what you wrote in your application essay, why you sought a degree in public administration. I strongly suspect that for most of you, a desire to help people directly or through improving the way government works was at the heart of your motivation. I find it interesting to hear stories about this motivation. For many, it's born of faith, firsthand experience, of a sense of calling. For others, it's ambition, patriotism, even frustration. For me, it came from a deep desire for fairness and opportunity. I shared with some of my fellow students an awareness of disparity and marginalization, of isolation and escape, of trauma and fear. Such experience cast a net of community and framed a purpose for a diverse set of us. I don't mean to speak for anyone other than myself, but I believe it fair to say that many of us hoped that future generations of Maxwell students would feel more empowered, more legitimate, more seen and heard following our careers in public administration. Our commitment reflected race and culture, class and experience, sex, gender and sexuality, and ability and access. 22 years ago, my class left to work within a system. 
you are leaving to work within a revolution. Your graduation does not change your status as student. Consider the trust that we grant to professors. Last year, you walked in the classrooms, grateful, excited even, for the opportunity to be taught, to learn from experts, scholars, and practitioners highly regarded in their fields. You read hundreds of pages of text that they assigned, authored by other people with fancy degrees. Then you sat through hours of mind-numbing Zoom lectures. Who are these people to whom you accorded such respect? For whom you made time? For whom you opened yourself to be influenced by? People largely unknown to you, albeit with credentials and employment. Now it is time to open yourselves up to learn from the people you will be serving. Now it's time to learn from Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, from women seeking justice through the Me Too movement, from LGBTQ people wishing to be afforded basic protections, from immigrants whose government failed to account for their interests, and the poor and others historically marginalized. Now it is time to believe them and accord respect without analysis. You are expected, you have a responsibility to continue to push yourself through real life experience. To acknowledge that you were taught an incomplete version of past, present, and future, designed to placate, to sustain, to hold in place. Appreciating that it is a privilege to represent, a privilege to affect people's lives, an approach without consultation and inclusion is conceited and patronizing. The motto of the disability rights community is nothing about us without us. The culture of public service must center itself on the promotion of respect and agency to the people we are serving. Given what we've been confronting, perhaps you, like me, wept upon learning of the Supreme Court's decision in Bostick v. Clayton County last week. Some wept from joy and relief. I wept from anger. Through the legal analysis and pontification of separation of powers, this was a case of admitted, unapologetic discrimination in employment. That an employer can withhold or withdraw a person's ability to work and earn an income. That an employer can deny a qualified individual an opportunity and disadvantage the employee, the customer, and the business in doing so. That an employer can exploit a worker by considering factors other than effort and outcome. Completely contrary to common sense. Add to that stupidity, hatred, bias, and a superiority complex. And then an obscene amount of money and time spent not only to defend the specific employers, but all employers right to perpetuate this behavior that has no purpose but to harm. I have worked myself beyond deep offense to a system that facilitates an academic consideration on the permissibility of discrimination. It is no longer time to debate whether the law approves of actions that distort the economy and debase people trying to make a living. We cannot inspire or aspire by thinking we have any right to vote on whether to extend a basic sense of dignity to any human being. In fact, we get to have no opinion, none at all, on the worth of each individual except to acknowledge that which is given by the creator. We are called to public service as we are called to love. Yet, the anti-racism scholar Ibram Kendi has proclaimed that true equality will take more than education and love. And that's what positions you to bring about real change. While a degree in public administration has required you to consider history, 
Your degree is not merely academic. You apply your knowledge to practical skills and current challenges. Your problem solving inevitably looks forward. Your contribution may make a process better today, may enhance efficiency and effectiveness, but the aim is often to improve people's lives in a lasting manner. And we need to do better. Some of us will have a platform or a seat at the table. Early in my career, I was asked to contribute to a guidance on improving access to services for people with limited English proficiency. It may seem small in a larger scheme, but by suggesting that service providers be aware of how people move to perform seasonal work, I helped reach more people, some of those persistently on the margins. In my tenure, I have signed dozens of guidance documents and decisions that have had the potential of expanding opportunity for large numbers of people. To enhance the effectiveness of government service, we must stretch to reach more people each time. By asking who or what can promote equality, we strengthen our circle. There is so much good you can do. We can envision what is sacred and beautiful for humanity as referenced in the Athenian oath. And that image reflects diversity and dignity. Although you are entering an arena that has not achieved the greatest good for the greatest number of people, you will be able to fulfill your oath by leading with the humility and integrity that was meant to anchor democracy. You have all of my good wishes. Thank you, Naomi. The Department of Public Administration and International Affairs has an award called the Burkhead Burkhead Award. Named after the late Guthrie Burkhead, the sixth dean of the Maxwell School, and the late Jesse Burkhead, who was a professor of economics and public administration. The award recognizing, recognizes teaching excellence by a faculty member in the Department of Public Administration and International Affairs. And the selection is made by a committee of faculty and students. Last year's Burkhead Burkhead recipient was Mika Rothbart. Professor Rothbart will address you today and then announce the 2020 award recipient. Mika. Congratulations, graduates, for your excellence this past year and your continued discipline despite the challenges of recent months. We commend your efforts towards making yourselves more capable and better prepared to meet the challenges yet to come. What's more, you made those investments in the pursuit of public service and citizenship, not to benefit yourselves alone, but to work towards a better collective condition for our world. I also believe that congratulations are owed to those who have supported you to get to this point including your partners, families, and friends. It is a tribute to them that you accomplished so much during difficult times. Nobody has accomplished anything of note going it alone. Today, I wanna to talk to you about justice. James Madison, one of the founders of this country and its fourth president wrote in Federalist 51, justice is the end of government. It is the end of civil society. He continued, it ever has been and ever will be pursued until it be obtained, or until liberty be lost in the pursuit. In other words, Madison hearkened back to biblical texts, Deuteronomy 1620, which states, justice, justice shall you pursue. And so my call for you today, and our hope for you as you advance in your careers in public administration, is that justice remains at the fore of what you chase and at the core of what you do. This is, of course, not just an American premise or a Judeo-Christian ideal, but rather an ethical imperative that stands at the center of every civil society, that we work towards a collective sense of truth, reason, principles, and ideals, that we treat each other fairly and mind the world in which we live. But justice is not merely the absence of falsehoods and maltreatment. Justice requires affirmative efforts. Pursuing justice means protecting the rights of today, taking corrective action for the wrongs of the past, and being brave enough to fight the wrongs of the present. 
We must pursue justice even as some try to deny it. It is not sufficient to be good to our families or act kindly to our neighbor. We also must fight for the stranger to make sure they too have access to just processes and are treated justly. In other words, be just, act justly, and most importantly, pursue justice. Just and justly are both laudable ways to be described, but justice is the ends of civil society and government itself. Justice is a call to action. In performance management, we would say that justice is the goal. Acting justly and being just are simply output and objectives. You can't only be agents of good. You must also be agents of change for the better. Justice, justice shall you pursue. As you peer out into your future and the pursuits ahead of you, consider the words of Theodore Parker, a mid 19th century abolitionist and Unitarian minister who said, I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one. My eye reaches but little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by experience of sight, but I can divine it by conscience. And from what I see, I am sure it bends towards justice. This sentiment was paraphrased most famously and most succinctly by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. But if the arc is bending anyhow, then why must we work so hard? Reverend Parker and Dr. King were not historical determinists and they did not believe justice is preordained. While the arc of morality bends towards justice, it is our efforts that press the bending of that long arc. The arc of the moral universe depends on our work, our pursuits to end slavery, our pursuits to end Jim Crow, and our pursuits to end the state's use of physical force against its citizens without providing them so much as due process, a trial, and a jury of their peers. Justice, justice shall you pursue. Your effort, your process, your work in the service of justice is what you should strive for even if you are unable to complete the task, even though you will likely stumble, even though you may fail. The entire history of civil society has been one of us coming up short in our pursuit of justice, and yet we must persist. Now is our time to get principled. Now is the time for us to get to work. Now is the time for us to pursue justice with everything we've got. And if not now, when? Justice, justice shall you pursue until, as Madison said, it be obtained or until liberty, until our freedom be lost in the pursuit. Be just, act justly, and pursue justice. Let's get to work. At this time, I am honored to announce this year's Burkhead Burkhead Award and Professorship winner. During a trying year on campus and around the world, this person showed resiliency to adapt to uncertainty and empathy for the challenges faced by students. It was wonderful to read comments from students that lauded how this professor's teaching met the gravity of the day. One student called out a course for combining real-time issues with the historical aspect of social policies. Another cited that the professor did a really nice job stimulating respectful discussions on issues that can spur a lot of emotion. A third student stated that in difficult times, Dr. So-and-so sets an example of the empathy and resolve needed to properly teach and mentor students. I couldn't think of three descriptors that would make someone more deserving of this award in this year. The 2019-2020 winner of the Burkhead Burkhead Award and Professorship is Dr. Catherine Mitchell Moore. Congratulations, Dr. Mitchell Moore. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm extremely honored to receive this award. I feel very lucky to be a part of the Maxwell community and this award means a lot to me. I feel like I have one of the best jobs in the world to not only teach, but also learn from such a wonderful group of intelligent, passionate, dedicated students. You probably knew coming into this program that it would be a difficult year, but I bet you had no idea just how difficult this year would be. These past few months have been extremely challenging as we dealt with abruptly transitioning classes online and striving to maintain our physical, mental, and emotional health as our sense of normalcy in our world has changed dramatically. But you persevered through it all, and I am extremely proud of all of you for making it here today. 
I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that the events of the last few months have not hit all of us equally. The COVID-19 pandemic and the workplace consequences of this pandemic have disproportionately affected black communities and communities of color and low income communities more so than higher income communities. This pandemic has rendered already stark inequalities in this country even starker. Not everyone has access to a stable home environment and to nutritious food, let alone a high speed internet connection and the necessary equipment to shift to an online learning environment. The extent of these inequalities are not yet fully known, but are likely vast. Beyond that, of course, is the growing sense of injustice in our country, as some of us come to terms with what many have known for far too long, that the systems and policies that have been in place in this country have benefited some of us while not only leaving some of us behind, but actively keeping some of us behind, the consequences of which have been felt by generations and may be felt for future generations to come. We needn't look very far for examples. Here in Syracuse, the I-81 highway was built right through the middle of a black neighborhood, destroying black owned small businesses and homes. Similar examples can be found across the country and the consequences in conjunction with decades of discriminatory housing practices can be summed up in a single statistic. On average, for every dollar of wealth held by white families, black families hold just five cents. And that gap gets even wider at the top of the wealth distribution. This is just one dimension of one metric of inequality in our country today. We could devote an entire semester to discussing the many, many sources of inequality in this country, their origins, their consequences, and potential ways to reduce them. I don't pretend to have a solution to these issues today, but I am encouraged in how these conversations are becoming part of a national dialogue on systemic racism and injustice. I am also encouraged by all of you, eminent graduates of the Maxwell School, who as scholars of public administration are perfectly poised to tackle some of these issues as you go on to evaluate and implement policies and practices at the federal, state, local, or international level. It is on all of us to do the work to educate ourselves to become better allies to each other. Amidst all of the injustice and uncertainty in our world today, it is also important and perhaps even more important to celebrate these joyous momentous occasions. And this one is no different. You worked extremely hard over these last months and you deserve to celebrate this amazing accomplishment. Take time to acknowledge all the hard work it took for you to make it to this day and truly enjoy this moment. As you embark on the next chapter of your lives, I hope beyond what you learned in the classroom here, that you will also take what you have learned from each other and pay it forward. No matter where you came from or how you got here, you are all now empowered graduates of the Maxwell School. And that is not only a privilege, but a responsibility. A responsibility to yourselves and to all of us to speak up against injustices when you see them, even when and especially when it makes you uncomfortable. Serve your communities as much as you can. When you find yourselves in positions of power, as you inevitably will, speak up not only for yourselves, but also for those who don't have a voice. Or better yet, take time to seek out those voices. Listen to them. Elevate them. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy, and congratulations. The student address is named after Brady K. Howell a member of the class of 2000 who lost his life on September 11th, 2001, while working at his desk in the Office of Naval Intelligence at the Pentagon. 19 years ago today, Brady sat in one of your seats and like you had hopes and dreams that unfortunately were cut short on that fateful day. The faculty and staff named the student address after Brady beginning with the 2002 graduating class as a way to honor his memory. This year's Brady K. Howell student address will be given by Sam Rogers. As an undergraduate, Sam Rogers was captain of the Syracuse football team, an academic All-American and a remembrance scholar. Most significant to Sam, he met his wife, Jenna, who was a captain of the women's soccer team. After graduating, Sam attended Cornell Law School. During law school, Sam worked for two federal judges, the Syracuse University General Counsel's Office and the New York City law firm Simpson Thatcher. After graduating from Cornell, Sam and Jenna elected to remain in Syracuse. While studying at Maxwell, Sam works part-time as an assistant district attorney and is currently running for New York State Senate. Sam? 
Well, good morning. Uh, congratulations to all. A special thank you to professors, administrators, family and friends, everyone who made today possible. Last week, my wife Jenna and I were in the car and we're similar, it seems, to most couples, whereas one of us is pretty good with directions, the other is not. Uh, we were in an obscure part of town and made a few turns. My wife looked at me and she finally asked, how in the world do you know where you are? I had to admit, I, I don't know where I am, but I know where I'm going. You see, the key to having a good sense of direction is not always knowing exactly where you are, but understanding where you started and the direction you are headed. All the twists and turns in between are only part of the journey. We've experienced many twists and turns over the last year. It's easy to focus on the reason that we're graduating virtually today and be disappointed, which is valid, but I believe that coronavirus completed our education. It separates our story, our year at Maxwell from those who came before us. Being part of the COVID class makes us the most equipped and prepared cohort of first year Maxwell grads ever. We experience a case study in adversity, crisis management, and real life public administration as students on top of an already demanding curriculum. So don't let the oddity attached to our final months distract your vision of how you got here and where you're going. Because I've learned we all have epic stories of how we got here. Each and every one of us has experienced many things making today's achievement truly remarkable. I remember my first exposure to the Maxwell School. You see, I went to Syracuse as an undergrad studying nutrition. Never once did I step foot in Maxwell Hall beside the statue of Abraham Lincoln, who I was pretty sure had no connection to SU. I wasn't sure what went on inside the building or what was studied. It wasn't until a year after I graduated, I ever entered Maxwell Hall. I was supporting a friend who was guest lecturing in a class called the Modern American Presidency. After the class, I walked out the doors down the steps, paused in front of that statue of Abraham Lincoln. And I remember thinking, huh, Maxwell students get credit for studying topics I study in my free time for fun. Did I miss out struggling through four years of biology and chemistry? I could feel Abe staring down at me with his grave expression. It was as if he was saying, yes. I eventually took Abe's counsel and here we all are. Today marks the day that we finally joined the prestigious ranks of alumni and professors that make up the Maxwell family, the so-called Maxwell Mafia. And it's today we get to look at our time beyond being students and focus on the direction we are going. Oddly enough, the Abraham Lincoln statue has something to say about this too. It's a peculiar statue. It's impossible not to notice the sad looking person it portrays. University archives don't document an unveiling ceremony in 1968, only a mention in the Daily Orange that says the unbearded Lincoln portrays him in his younger days of poetic vision of promise rather than fulfillment. So I ask, how is it that one of the most celebrated, possibly wisest statesperson our country has ever known sits so somber before his journey even began? It's a look that if we're honest, we may also portray as we look over the promise of our careers as public administrators, the challenges facing our states, our countries, and even our world. Lincoln knew that leadership in public administration has a price. Lest we forget, Abraham Lincoln was the face of a brand new political party. With only the news of his election, seven states immediately left the union claiming he is not our president. Lincoln embarked on a war that killed more Americans than any other. He fired many generals. He was the first and only commander in chief to achieve victory, then afterwards have to lead the winners and the losers. With one signature, he proclaimed to everybody that black lives matter. He set a path to reconstruction defined by grace and seven days after peace was guaranteed by General Lee's surrender, Lincoln was forever laid to rest in peace. It's easy to study his tumultuous life with hindsight and acknowledge his brilliance, but what firsthand accounts make clear is that at the time, each decision was scrutinized and criticized from all angles. Voices spoke about Lincoln's inferior character, labeled him a man unequal to the crisis he faced. But there Lincoln remained, with the courage to withstand his moral critics. Moral critics meaning people who not only question the premise of your belief, but attack your character for daring to hold such a belief. Friends, 
welcome to the career of public administration. There will be a day we will read of the public decisions of our colleagues graduating with us today. Some of us may rejoice in their wisdom, others will question their logic, but let us all acknowledge their hearts and the principles formed together in the Zoom chat rooms and halls of Eggers and Maxwell. For had we been together in 1968, when the Lincoln statue was placed, we would have noticed the seemingly odd decision not to position Lincoln in a way to make Maxwell Hall his eternal backdrop. It was an intentional decision to turn Lincoln 90 degrees, make him gaze over the Syracuse community, a representation to Maxwell students that when we walk out of the building, we have an obligation to our communities to take hold of our moral courage and stand strong in the face of critics. So to my classmates, my hope is that we take on the inevitable criticism attached with our career choice with honor. Never forget where you started, the lessons learned from what you experienced, and never lose sight of the direction you are going. If possible, find someone willing to get lost with you along the way. And as we take our degrees and intend to make our marks on our respective communities, remember this quote. If you wish to avoid criticism, say nothing, do nothing, and be nothing. Thank you, let's get to work. Thank you, Sam. And now the part of the ceremony you've been waiting for when we recognize each of our graduates. You have come to us from all over the United States and all over the world. Some of you came to us freshly out of undergraduate studies and others of you had had, had substantial prior work experience. Some of you have been juggling work, graduate school and parenting. And for those of you in that category, we offer a special bravo. So now without further ado, Please roll the tape. Crystal Ball Ignacio Aldea Hernandez, Chad Ames, Benjamin Andrews, Raid Ashur. John Bailey, Albert Bindokas, Mika Bright, Caitlin Brown, Kimball Brown, Emily Burkhart, Ioanya Calderon Rome, Daniel Cordial. Philip Stujawski, Alna Dahl, Melissa English, Aliha Isan, Kimberly Fuller, Christopher Giglio, Ingrid Gonzalez McCurdy, Kristen Harmon, Robert Hilborn, Don Hyun, Suha Jabur, Timothy Johnson, Jitendra Kumar Hushi, Pawan Kalarwal, Cameron Keys. Zachary Kramer, Seema Kumar, Matthew Larson, Daniel Lewis, Rupali Mahadik, Anar Mamadali, Takanori Manashi. Tun Myo Mong, Samar Nanda, Shiv Narain, Ahmed Adel Noor, Haruna Numata, 
Andrew Ovalgoner, Fariba Paju, Jeremy Pickens, Tanika Pinter, Catherine Quartaro, Catherine Ramlo, Tanya Ridgeway, Sean Rodman, Glenn Sanders, Amy Sargent, Dinesh Sharma, Richard Shaw, Ermi Srivastava, Ram Singh, Corey Sullivan, Michael Sweeney, Ryan Swires, Mo Talk, Wesley Tudor, Shannon Ulep, Anna Vasquez, Vernon Wall, Melissa Whips, Phoebe Akiar. Mark Palladino, Andrew Onieno, Eric Baker, Jack Baldwin, Zerlina Bartholomew, Lord Boateng, Michelle Boulet, Ashley Brush, Connor Burris, Maggie. Callahan, Taylor Carter DeSanto, Abigail Shampo, Peiting Chen, Nathaniel Clark, Alexander Cousins, Colby Cyrus, Alexandra DeSimone, Emma Diltz, Joshua Doherty, Michaela Egan, Lindsay Finman, Catherine Gibson, Roger Gildersleeve, Laura Gooding, Geneva Guadalupe, Charlotte Hallett, Ewan Sue. Daniela Fernanda Huertas Mendoza, DJ Johnson, Jet Janalis, Sparsh Cancel, Bartholomew Castle, Quebec Kim, Leah Knobel, Lorella Lazai, Christopher Lichave. Spencer Lindsay, Rachel Lindsay, Samantha Lynette, Kenyi Lacolo, Letso Mapa, E.T. Maloney, Matthew Marcelino, Molly Martin, Daniel McMurray, Jonathan Medina, Catherine Medina, Hamza Migri, Adam Miller, Stephen Murphy, Avia Narin, Parker Nash, Fama Inday, Lynn Nguyen, Phoebe O'Connor, Adam Palmer, G. Young Park, Jonathan Pilat, Stephanie Prohaska, Lauren Quick, Roberto Quijano, Jennifer Rachel, 
Nicholas Ramos. Erica Rollins. Soren Reichert. Karen Wrighton. Lachelle Robinson Hernandez. J. Samuel Rogers. Nicholas Rogers. Oscar Selikov. Nathaniel Saltzman. Adam Sawyer. Caitlin Simmons. Haley Smith. Christopher Spawn. Erica Stuck. Lauren Sutkus. Mahin Tariq. Deva Tia. Caitlin Tiongson. Makani Toure. Alejandro Torino. Sahi Upalapati. Catherine Ustler. Margarita Falkovskaya. Cole Ware. Michael Whalen. Wesley Wilson. Sean Withington. Rob Woodruff. Fiona Wu. Shiyang Su. Roni Ackerman. Dumisa Adams. Brandy Andrews. Rachel Barnhart. Christopher Cartwright. Philip Fant. Miguel Figueroa. Frank Hackett. James Hartman, Kathleen Hoffman, Ryan Holak, Peter Karpinski, Jeffrey Cavulia, Shumane Kittison, Angie Laurie, Bradley Leon, Julie Medler, Andrew Meehan, Megan Miller, Meredith Mullen, Joseph Novak Jr., Matthew Passarell, Christopher Rondinelli, Thomas Strom, Margot Thomas, Vernon Utley, Dennis Vicarelli, Brandon White. Congratulations to everyone. Chris Cartwright currently serves as the budget director and acting finance director for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Following his graduation from Syracuse as an undergraduate dual major at Maxwell and Newhouse in 1990, he started a 30 year career in federal financial management with the US Department of Commerce. Chris returned to Maxwell as part of the initial online EMPA cohort in 2017 and completed the EMPA degree last December. He and his wife, Kara, have two adult sons, Kevin and Keith. At this point in the ceremony, we will unmute the meeting so that everyone may join Chris as he leads us with the recitation of the Athenian Oath. Thank you. Uh, it's my honor to lead the recitation of the oath. Please join with me. We will ever strive for the ideals and sacred things of the city. Both alone and with many. Security positive is how much again? Sorry. All right, Chris, we're going to start again. 
So that would be a return on the final day of. Uh, <laughs> All right, Chris, we're going to try that again. We knew this would be an adventure, so we're going to try again. Ready? <laughs> All right, Tom, if you can put it up on the screen, that would be great. We will ever strive for the ideals and the sacred things of the city. Both alone and with men. Okay, we knew that was going to be an adventure, but we wanted to at least give you some some opportunity to participate uh, in, in the ceremony. Um, so uh, next up, I would be remiss if I did not thank our incredible public administration and international affairs staff for all their hard work in planning this event and the superb work that they do all year long. Please join me in recognizing the two people who played a key role in your decision to come here and your success while you were here. Director, Director of Admissions and Financial Aid, Christine Omolino, and Associate Director of Student Services, Josh Kennedy. Next, I'd like to thank Ken Dwyer, Isaac Olson, Heather Macknick, and Christy Vega for the exceptional job they do in all facets of the program throughout the year. And a special thanks to Christy and Tom Fazio for all the work they did to organize this ceremony under these very unusual circumstances. I also want to acknowledge the dedicated career and alumni services staff, Kelly Young, Alexandra Bennett, Lauren Meyer, and Jessica Walcott-Murray. Finally, let me acknowledge our faculty. An academic program is only as good as its faculty. They are an amazing group of teachers, scholars, and colleagues. Thank you all for your continued commitment to excellence. I hope that your time spent at the Maxwell School will serve you well in the years to come. You have made friends that will last a lifetime. Friends are important, but what unites you as friends also unites you with all Maxwell alumni. By using the skills and knowledge learned here at Maxwell, you will, to paraphrase the Athenian Oath one last time, make the city greater and more beautiful than it was transmitted to you. On behalf of the faculty and staff, it has been a pleasure getting to know all of you over the past year. We can't wait to see all the amazing things that you accomplish, and we hope you will keep in touch. Don't be afraid to brag to us. It's one of the best parts of our jobs. And also, I encourage you all to visit with faculty and staff in the Zoom rooms they have arranged. I'm sure they will appreciate the chance to say goodbye and wish you well. The convocation ceremony is now adjourned, but before you go, we will close with some farewell messages we have prepared. Well, hello, 2020 graduates. Congratulations. It's a wonderful accomplishment and it's been a challenging year, but really um, happy to be sending my messages to you here. But before I do that one last time, 
I want to remind you about the perfectly competitive market that maximizes total social welfare, where we have the area of consumer surplus plus producer surplus, and we have a market clearing equilibrium. Just wanted to get that in one last time. I can't stress it enough. And I want to say, well, it depends. And well, it has a lot of moving parts because I know you've come to expect that from me at this point. Take care. Best wishes going forward. And I really enjoyed spending time with you this year in our very odd year. <laughs> Take care. Congratulations. Congratulations. As someone who finished their MPA in the heart of the Great Recession, I just want to say you're going to be okay and you're going to do great things. From my favorite spot in Labrador Hollow, I'm Professor Colleen Heflin. Congratulations, graduates. I leave you with one thought from Albert Einstein. Strive not to be a success, but rather to be a value. Go do good. I'm so excited for you guys. Congratulations. Hi, everyone. It was a crazy and tough end of the year, but you all came through it with flying colors. I'm super proud of all of you. Congratulations and have a great summer. Hi, 2020 grads. It was such a pleasure to be part of your time at Maxwell, and I wish you my heartiest congratulations on your achievement and my best wishes for your future success. Congratulations, everyone. It's been a tough year, but you're an awesome group and have been up to it in every respect. Smart, strong, super resilient, and you have great pets. Good luck with all the challenges ahead and stay in touch. Congratulations to the class of 2020. I'd like to wish you a hearty congratulations. Thank you for spending time with us at the Maxwell School. We wish you the very best luck and hope that you'll keep in touch. Congratulations to all of you. Best wishes for a wonderful career launching from uh, Maxwell. Hey graduates, your persistence this year is evidence you're ready to engage challenging problems. As a person of faith, I'm optimistic about your future. I believe each one of you is made with a purpose to help restore what is broken. So go serve the world. Congratulations. Three Maxwell MPAs walk into a bar. You'll be able to do that someday and it'll be really cool. Congratulations. Congratulations to everyone graduating. We're so proud of you. You did it. And under some pretty extreme circumstances, we're so excited to see what you do next. Congratulations again. Congratulations, everybody. So proud of everything you accomplished and so happy about what you brought to the Maxwell School. Best of luck to you in the future. Congratulations, everyone. As you leave the halls of Maxwell and start the next exciting phase of your lives, remember, be kind, don't cheat, and use your powers for good. Well done. Congratulations again. Congratulations, 2020 grads. I'm so proud of you all. You guys all made it through a really hard semester and you should all be really proud of yourselves. Um, Henry would be wishing you a, a congratulations as well, but he's too busy protecting our yard from, uh, from chipmunks and squirrels. Congrats. Hi, this is Nell Barkoviak, the director of the online EMPA program. Congratulations to all of our graduates. We are so proud of you. Please stay in touch. Congratulations, you made it. Remember, with great power comes great responsibility. Use your power for good, and please keep in touch. Hi, Chris. Oh. Hello?